as Dean Martin mentioned in his remarks, the, the language corpora, my case, and my cusp are two landmarks in ELI's longstanding commitment to applied linguistics research. These historically significant bodies of language are unique for their focus on academic discourse and for these extensive teaching materials that were developed around them. Our, in our first panel, we'll look at these and several other important language corpora in order to better understand this incredibly diverse and dynamic field of corpus linguistics. And who better to lead this panel than Michigan's own Anne Curzan. Uh, Anne is the Associate Dean for the Humanities at LSNA and an Arthur C. Uh, F. Thurnau Professor of English. She also has faculty appointments in the Department of Linguistics and in the uh, Michigan uh, School of Education. Her many books and articles focus on the history of the English language, attitudes about language change, language and gender, lexicography, and pedagogy. She also writes about language for the Chronicle of Higher Education's Lingua Franca blog, and is well known to local NPR listeners for her Sunday morning discussions of language use and language change, I might add with frequent references to corpus searches uh, on uh, the Michigan Radio's That's What They Say segment. Please welcome Ann Curzan. Thank you for the introduction, and I'm absolutely delighted to be here to get to facilitate this panel today. Um, I was first introduced to Corpus Linguistics in 1995, when I was a graduate student here at the University of Michigan, and Richard W. Bailey uh, took me to the ICAME conference, which was being held in Toronto. And I do know that Richard Bailey would love to be here today to celebrate this occasion, and um, I'm sorry he can't. He can't be here to see this and celebrate. Um, 1995, Corpus Linguistics was a largely European enterprise. <laughs> there was a lot of Corpus Linguistics going on in Europe, uh, less in the United States. I remember my first faculty job at the University of Washington. One of the first talks they asked me to give was a talk called, What is Corpus Linguistics? Um, and, and trying to explain, what is this? What is this? Is it a field? Is it a method? What's a corpus? Um, and we're going to be talking about that some today. Of does it have to be systematic, or can it just be a big sprawly thing <laughs> that you can search? Uh, and it was a time when corpus linguistics was, to some extent, still emerging from counting, or at least people thought it was emerging from counting. People said, "What is interesting beyond counting? Counting is interesting. How frequent is something? But what else can corpus linguistics?" do, and of course, corpus linguistics has proved to be enormously powerful in terms of the study of language variation and language change. Um, that's variation across region, variation across register. And as these four speakers are going to be telling us about, it has proved to be very important for language learning and language teaching, um, and that this is a very powerful tool to be used both in the classroom and outside the classroom. So I'm delighted that we get to have this panel today. And the ELI put Michigan on the map by creating my case and creating my cusp, that Michigan was the leader in the United States in terms of corpus development. Um, and the, those database, particularly my case when it was first created, was this chance to search spoken language in a way that had been very difficult. I mean, there were other spoken corpora available, but this was a chance to search academic uh, language. I remember doing an early study on yeah, no, <laughs> as well as no, yeah, and <laughs> no, I know, which is a very interesting use of no. Um, and, and my case proved to be very, very useful for that. Um, so we've got these, we have four panelists today. They are going to be talking about their own work as well as circling around two questions that we've asked them to think about and that we then look forward to having a conversation with all of you and the four of them after their talks. And the two questions are, how would you characterize the current moment in the evolution of corpus linguistics? Where do you see it heading? What should we have in mind? That's, of course, a huge question, but we decided to give that to them. And the second one, um, what are some key considerations for language teachers for using language corpora? Um, are there unexplored ways that we can use these for teaching and learning? 
So those are the two thematic questions that we will have over the next hour and 20 minutes or so. Um, I will briefly introduce each speaker before they speak. The order will be that Ucha Romer is going to start us off, and then we will have Mark Davies, Sigurd Cordell, and then Nick Ellis. So I'm delighted to welcome back Uta Romer, who is now assistant professor in the Department of Applied Linguistics and ESL at Georgia State University. From 2007 to 2011, she was director of the Applied Corpus Linguistics Unit at ELI, where she managed my case and my cusp. Her research interests include corpus linguistics, phraseology, second language acquisition, academic discourse analysis, language learning, and teaching. She's also the editor of the book series, Studies in Corpus Linguistics. So welcome back for this celebration, and I will turn the floor over to you. Which, which mic is on? Okay, um, that's the one. Okay, can you, can you hear me okay? Yeah, all right. So, um, first of all, thank you very much um, and for the kind introduction. Um, I must say my goal for the next 15 minutes is not to lose my voice. I'm uh, struggling a little bit, um, you, you can probably hear that, but hopefully I'll make it, I'll make it through um, without fading out completely. Um, it's, it's exciting to be back here in Ann Arbor. Um, as Anne mentioned, I was here from 2007 to 2011 in charge of the Corpus projects, and um, it's always great to be back, especially to be back in Rackham, where I spend a lot of time. Um, I think I did most, most of my writing here uh, during my Ann Arbor time in this building, in this beautiful, beautiful reading rooms. So um, these are the two prompts we were given for our remarks. And I'm not going to read them out again because you just heard them. But what I'd like to do um, in my remarks is focus on these um, topics here. I will focus on pedagogically useful corpus resources and highlight the important role that the ELI has played in applied corpus linguistics and also how it has helped shape the field and put us on the map, as Anne said. Um, my focus will be on small, smallish, and um, more specialized corpora, not so much the, the large ones. Um, although, you know, it's, uh, you can argue that uh, a corpus of 1.8 million words of speech is pretty large already. Um, so that's the focus. And then I'll, I'll uh, distinguish direct and indirect pedagogical corpus applications in my talk. So um, the first question, corpus linguistics right now and where are we headed? I see two concurrent trends in current um, corpus linguistics. Um, we have large corpora on the one hand side, uh, discussion about big data, uh, that's certainly a key word right now, and um, natural language processing applications. And on the other hand, we have small and specialized corpora, which are carefully designed, carefully annotated, and uh, the so-called local corpora designed and compiled by um, researchers and teachers for whatever needs they have in a specific um, pedagogical context. And I think, if I think of applied corpus linguistics, I think we need both. We, need, we can benefit from uh, the large corpora on the one hand side and, and data mining and, and NLP applications, but we also need to um, focus on some of the more specialized corpora. And, and the more specialized your corpus is, the, the more okay it is to be small, because um, if you have a specific type of language, it'll be more patterned, um, and so you can you can you can get away with a smaller corpus essentially. Um, also, oops, sorry, I have to go back. Also. Um, we see a growing number of online corpora becoming available and free tools that are easier to use than they used to be. And uh, an increasing use of corpora in pedagogical contexts. So um, I mentioned DDL, which stands for data-driven learning. So we have more studies uh, on how effective data-driven learning is. And it's been shown to be, to actually make a difference, bringing corpora into the classroom and using concordances and corpus-derived materials in teaching. 
we have more um, resources, especially um, what I mentioned, local corpora, learner corpora, um, that is a collections of language actually produced by learners, which could then uh, help us find out well, what, what, are, what are my learners struggling with? What do they need help with? And that's very important to, to find out. We also have better trained teachers. Um, the, the program I teach in right now has a corpus linguistics class for um, master students who uh, then go and teach ESL. So our, um, our teachers, our ESL, EFL teachers, are, um, more, are better trained and in corpus linguistics too. In an article I wrote during my time here at the ELI, and as I mentioned, probably in, in the rooms of this building, um, the reading rooms on the second floor, I distinguish between indirect applications, uh, pedagogical applications of corpora on the one hand, and direct corpus, pedagogical corpus applications on the other. So on the indirect side, um, teachers and learners do not interact with the corpus and the and corpus materials directly, but um, researchers and materials writers do. So the idea is that you use corpus evidence in pedagogical materials, and that can have an effect on the syllabus, it can have an effect on reference works and teaching materials. So we're using corpus evidence, and, and you're probably all familiar with corpus-based grammar books. Most of the dictionaries now available are corpus-based, so that would be an indirect pedagogical application. Um, on the other hand, we have direct pedagogical corpus applications, and that means that the teacher and or learner actually um, interacts directly with the resource um, by looking up words, looking up phrases, looking at concordances, so displays of lots of examples of a word or phrase in context, and that way looking for patterns in a serendipitous um, uh, way so that, that you, you discover new things about language all the time. If we look at these two types of applications in an EAP setting, I just listed a few examples of um, indirect corpus applications here. Um, corpora, especially corpora of academic writing, um, have, a, have been shown to have a positive impact on syllabus and materials design. And they provide guidance for teachers with a very important question that, uh, as Laura Gavioli mentions, working out basic items to be dealt with is a key teaching problem. So what do I teach? Um, especially when you're not an expert in the field that you're teaching. If you teach a group of engineering students and that's not your background, or business school or astronomy students, um, you may need a resource that helps you find out well, what are some of the most important concepts that these learners need to, to know, and that's where Corpora can help. Um, two very important projects and um, I think we'll hear more about the second one from uh, Nick Ellis later on, um, are the a AWL, the Academic Word List, which focuses on high-frequency academic English words and presents them in, uh, by way of, of word families, and then taking the AWL to the phrase level, to multi the multi-word level, Rita Simpson Flax and Nick Ellis' Academic Formulas List um, are, are important. Um, examples of this type of application. On the direct side, classroom concordancing has been shown as a useful tool in teaching EAP and ESP. And um, that includes words that you think your learners already know, um, but they may not know how these words are used, high frequency nouns for instance, how these words are used in, um, in a specific context in the EAP or ESP context that they're in. So, a word like way or hand, of course they know what hand means, but um, they may not be familiar with the phraseology of hand in academic writing, um, as we use it a lot in, in chunks, like on the other hand, on, on the one end, on the other hand. So I think that EAP learners can profit from awareness raising activities and gain insights into the phraseology of academic writing. And um, this has already been mentioned before, but I, I, I think we have to repeat this many, many times because it's, it's, so, it's so important, uh, the contributions that the ELI has made, uh, both ELI researchers and teachers, by, by creating and also sharing um, resources for all of these purposes that I just mentioned. So um, the flagship is probably this corpus here, and I've given you a, a screenshot of the online search interface, my case, the Michigan Corpus of Academic Spoken English, 
which allows you to search for uh, words and phrases in different types of speech events across, from across the University of Michigan. Uh, about 200 hours of recordings, um, 1.8 million words, sampled from a wide range of different disciplines and speech events. And um, the online interface allows you to zoom in on specific um, types of texts and interactions, if, depending on the discipline or the speech event types, type you're interested. So um, I narrowed down my search here for interesting, which is an interesting um, item in academic speech for sure. Um, I narrowed it down to my case dissertation defenses. And um, it's, it's, it's really small. This is a concordance of interesting that I sorted um, to the right. But oops, one thing you see um, if you zoom in, uh, some, some interesting chunks that have uh, important pragmatic functions, like, um, that's an interesting question. Um, and I assume that the, 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 the PhD student uh, said that um, in this case. So um, that's an interesting question. Let me think about that. What, 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 do, you, what do you do while you use this chunk is, is, you know, make sure you have some more planning time for your next response, I guess. So, what the online interface allows us to see are important patterns that are used in academic speech. Um, my case is also available for offline use if you want to go beyond the um, search function of the interface. You can download the uh, text files and the sound files from the TalkBank archive, so they're, um, they're all available there. There's also MyCusp, the Michigan Corpus of Upper Level Student Papers, as um, has already been mentioned, a collection of um, 829 student papers, about 2.6 million words, and uh, they're all A-graded, so that's an important aspect. We wanted to collect papers that are good models of student writing from 16 different disciplines, students at um, four levels of study, starting with um, senior undergraduates, so upper level student writing, and we included native and non-native speaker contributions. This corpus is also freely available online through uh, the MyCusp Simple interface, and I'll show you that um, in a minute. So um, what do we need to keep in mind? That was the, part, part of the, the last part of the first question. Um, I think as a corpus linguist, as an applied corpus linguist, one thing I keep reminding myself was, of is um, keeping learners and teachers needs in mind, um, both in terms of tool development, resource development, materials development. And another thing I think we, we all need to keep in mind is what researchers in other fields need. If we want corpus linguistics to remain successful and to become uh, more widely used even, we need to see what we can help others with and, and reach out to other disciplines. I see corpus linguistics mostly as a method, uh, a toolkit, um, a methodology. So um, if any discipline that has texts, I think, can benefit from this kind of uh, approach and from these tools. And so if, if they have texts, we know what to do with texts. We know what to, how to analyze them, how to extract patterns, even if they consist of numbers. And this, this uh, screenshot sample you see here is a concordance that is based on a corpus of um, improvised Charlie Parker solos. Um, I've worked with a um, music professor at Georgia State University on a project where we try to find out what role melodic patterns play in Parker improvisations. So it doesn't have to be words, texts consisting of words. Um, these, are, these, th these are examples of the uh, most frequent four interval pattern in uh, Charlie Parker's solos. And um, he uses this pattern uh, 184 times. So um, you can find out you can find out more about um, patterns in all sorts of language and non-language data. Also, another question: What we keep, need to keep in mind is how can we connect with related disciplines and learn from them? Uh, moving on to the second set of questions: uh, What are some considerations for teachers? And I listed a few questions that came to mind. Um, first of all, do I want to use corpora? and corpus-derived materials in, in my teaching. What, 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 are, what are they useful for? Maybe we can come back to some of these questions during the discussion. Um, what materials and resources are already available to me? Are they easy to use? Are they free? And some of the, uh, the resources we created here um, had that goal to be, well, free for sure, but also be easy to use. Um, do I need any specific training? 
and can help me address the questions we need to address. Um, a few weeks ago, I spoke at a uh, British Academy funded training event for teachers in Scotland. And I started my uh, workshop session with uh, a needs analysis. I tried to find out, well, what, what do these teachers actually need? What kind of help do they need? And how can I contribute as a corpus linguist? And um, that reminded me that I did a uh, study, I carried out a study in Germany a few years uh, before um, with EFL teachers to find out well, what are their needs. And I'm not going to read these out here, but um, essentially things that teachers said they needed help with are things that corpus linguists can help with and can address. So uh, better materials, more authentic materials. Um, uh, a, a, someone who can be there as a, like a native speaker consultant and help with questions about, like, can I use this preposition with this verb? That's what a corpus can easily um, do for us. And so an online corpus like MyCusp, and here's the uh, online search interface or a screenshot of it, um, I think can help address many of these questions on the previous slide. It's um, user-friendly. It was designed with users in mind who are not corpus linguists. So essentially all you need to do is find the search box at the top, type something in and hit search, and then you get the, the results. We also um, annotated MyCusp. Every, every um, paper in MyCusp was annotated, um, classified um, by, based on paper types and textual features, and that was very much inspired by conversations I had here with EAP instructors in the ELI, and um, these are the textual features and paper types here. Maybe we can come back to that. We also included word clouds to highlight what each of the 829 papers is about. Clearly, this is about teleportation um, <laughs> and um, quantum something. Um, we also added P PDF uh, versions of each paper to the uh, database so you can go back to what the paper looked like. Final uh, question was on underexplored pedagogical corpus resources. Well, I think there's still, um, or ap applications, there's still a lot more to explore with corpora like MyCASP and MyCASP and other free online resources that I, I'm sure we'll hear, from, um, hear about from, from Mark. Um, perhaps even considering creating our own um, small corpora and use them with exist, existing um, tools like AntConc. And um, I think there's, a, there's now a, 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 an exciting trend that corpora are linked or transcripts of corpora are linked to videos and sound files like in the TED corpus search interface that I just wanted to mention as my, this is my last slide, um, where you, you have a corpus of TED talks and you can search for phrases and words and then click on each line and go straight to the video and um, see, well, how is this, what's the intonation, how is this used? Uh, and you have, for this case, at the same time, that's an important chunk, you have 451 instances, so that's a lot of material to use. I'm going to stop here um, and end with some thanks from Michigan students from the MICA corpus. Thank you all. Thank you, Uta. That was great. Um, and I appreciate you emphasizing that one of the really important things when the ELI created my case and my cusp was that they were freely available. And this was actually, in early corpus linguistics, not something to take for granted, that those early corpora were often things you had to buy on a CD-ROM or something to get access to it. Um, and I will use that as a transition to our next speaker. We will have time at the end for discussion, um, which is Professor Mark Davies will be our next speaker. He's a professor of linguistics at Brigham Young University in Provo, Utah. And he is the creator of several large corpora, including the Corpus of Contemporary American English and the Corpus of Historical American English. And these are huge corpora. And one of the things that Mark did was make them freely available, and this was incredibly exciting at the time and really opened up all new avenues for those of us working in the field next to my case. So um, these corpora are used by more than 130,000 distinct people each month. So I like the distinct part so that when my students are on there all at the same time, <laughs> on a given class day, Mark's separating them out um, so he knows what's going on with that. Um, which, which may probably makes these the most widely used corpora cur currently in existence. Mark has published widely on corpus-based approaches to historical change and genre-based variation and is the recipient of six large federal grants, um, NEH and NSF, to create these large online corpora. So Mark, thanks for coming. We're delighted to have you here.
to get it to go forward. Okay. Okay. But that is working. Okay. That'll be fine. All right. It's a pleasure to be here. The uh, first Corpus Linguistics Conference that I ever went to in the United States was held here at the University of Michigan in Rita, 1999, 98-99, somewhere back there. Um, this is a little bit awkward presentation for me in the sense that uh, I don't teach English as a second language, but I am a corpus creator. And so that's what I'm going to be focusing on in this presentation is what a certain class of corpora can allow us to do, especially in terms of looking at academic English. And I'm going to be focusing here mainly on lexical and semantic issues. I by training them as syntactician, but I'm not going to be talking much about that in this presentation. So uh, I'm going to be focusing here on corpora that we've created at BYU, how they've been used throughout the world. I'll be talking very briefly about COCA, uh, Corpus of Contemporary American English that has about 105 million words of academic English. Then I'll be talking about some derived resources. Once we have corpora of this size, of this breadth, what can we do in terms of extracting frequency data, and I'll be talking about um, some frequency resources based on COCA. And then I'll transition very briefly into another resource called wordandphrase.info, which uses COCA data but is much more oriented towards language learners. One of the problems we have with corpora is learners show up there and it's just absolutely overwhelming. They can't figure out what to do. And so this resource is designed for students like that. And then the last one, uh, last resources that, I, that I'm going to talk about very briefly is a Wikipedia corpus. Let's say that you want to create a specialized corpus for biology or molecular biology or however specific you want. Um, how can you generate those types of uh, keyword lists and so on? So that's where I'll be going. All right, so BYU corpora, as Ann mentioned, there's a number of different BYU corpora. I'll just be talking about COCA, uh, primarily in this presentation, Corpus of Contemporary American English. So it's now up to about 520 million words, um, over 200,000 texts. Uh, one of the nice things about COCA is that every year it's added to 20 million words from the five genres of spoken fiction, uh, popular magazine, newspaper, and academics. So you get a nice uh, range of, of types of English. Um, so as far as the academic part goes, like I said, uh, 105 million words um, based on over 100 uh, peer-reviewed journals, kind of covering the entire span of the Library of Congress uh, subject category. So, you know, there's engineering, there's medicine, there's law, and so on. And this gives you an idea of the nine or ten major uh, domains in uh, COCA and the number of words there. So again, medicine, health, history, science, law and political science, and so on. All right, so uh, someone uh, by the name of Ann Kurzan had a really nice post in the Chronicle uh, a couple days ago on hints. And in this, present, in this uh, article, she referenced the fact that using COCA, we're able to get a fairly nice idea of where hence is used. And so after I read that yesterday, I went in, just did a simple search. And for those of you that are users of COCA, you're going to realize that I'm using the, I'm showing the older interface here. There's a newer one since May, but it's the same data underneath. So uh, in this case, you just come in, you put in the word hence, you choose chart, and you can see that hence really is much, much more common in academic. Now you can do this for any word, any phrase, any syntactic construction. So we just put in the word correlate, and you can see it's much more frequent in academic. Put in the word whereas, see it's much more different in academic. But you can also use this in kind of a negative sense. So students might want to put into a paper, you know, there were a lot of reasons that FDR blah, blah, blah. And if they look up that phrase in COCA, what they're going to find is that in academic, a lot of is not used much at all. And so this can potentially help students to not overuse phrases and words that are really common in spoken English, but you wouldn't find in academic so much. Um, moving into syntactic-y kinds of things, 
uh, appear to, appear to be, okay? Very, uh, not limited exclusively to academic, but much, much more common in academic. Even things like phrasal verbs, okay? So a verb followed by out, for example. What you can do in COCA is you can say, look in one section of the corpus, compare it to another section of the corpus. So here we have uh, phrasal verbs without in academic compared to fiction. You can see how very different those are. Um, for these types of things, a, a large corpus ends up being quite useful. Um, or for example, the be passive, much, much more common in academic, which always comes as a surprise to students who are told that the passive is something horrible that they need to avoid. But in fact, in careful academic writing, it's where you find it the most. Uh, or for example, modal, so must followed by a lexical verb. Again, uh, we must admit, we must recognize, much more common in academic. Um, Besides uh, syntax uh, and lexical issues, you can use this even for morphology. So here I'm saying, for example, find me adjectives that end in AL, and you'll see that they're much more common in academic. And if you get an aggregate figure for those, much, much more common to find these in academic than in other genres. Uh, in terms of um, collocates and semantic issues, you can look, for example, for a uh, significant noun, but again, limit it in COCA just to academic, to the 105 million words of academic, see what words occur most with significant. You can look at collocates, forwards to the left, forwards to the right, for example, with framework, what are the words that you're gonna find near framework? And of course, in all of these cases, you see the word in context here, you click here, and you can get even more context. Um, and this can be really useful in terms of looking at semantic differences between academic and other genres. So here, for example, I say, find me nouns near chair and compare academic on the left with fiction on the right. And you'll see that, yeah, both genres use chair, but obviously in a very, very different way. Uh, this is just one last example. One thing you can do with COCA is you can search by synonym. So here I say, find me synonyms of strong and look in academic and compare that to fiction. And you can see that, uh, yeah, these are all synonyms of strong, but very, very different meanings of strong. So you wouldn't want students talking about a strong argument, but using a big, beefy, burly argument or a brawny, <laughs> strapping argument, okay? Um, and I may come back to that later. Okay, so. You have uh, this 105 million words of uh, ac uh, academic text in COCA. One of the nice things you can do then is you can take this data to create uh, frequency lists. So with D. Gardner, uh, we created a frequency dictionary of American English, uh, the top 5,000 words. It lists the top 20 to 30 collocates with each word and there's a number of thematic lists as well. This came out, oh, I don't know, maybe five years or so ago. So this is just one of the 5,000 entries. So for example, hypothesis, the 3,396th most common word in English. You can see the adjectives that occur with hypothesis, the nouns that occur with hypothesis. This notation here is an indication to readers that this word is found much more in academic than it is in the other genres. So, uh, and then once you get to that point, you can start generating lists, for example, of what are the nouns, what are the verbs, what are the adjectives and so on that are more common in academic than in the other genres. And uh, there's a 100,000 word list. There's no way that you can see this, it's too small, but it's got the top 100,000 word forms in uh, English. And for each one of these, you can find the frequency in COCA academic, in the BNC academic, and in uh, informal, uh, more informal varieties as well. So after we created that, we thought, well, one thing we might wanna do is create an academic vocabulary list. Um, as Uta mentioned, there already is a academic word list that was created by Coxhead in 2000, which is a wonderful list. Many wonderful, wonderful things have been done with that list. Um, 
but on the one hand, it's, it's based on a relatively small corpus, about three, three and a half million words, most of those from sources in New Zealand, okay, from back then. So we thought it might be nice to take something a little bit uh, uh, more recent that includes stuff from the United States and that is much, much, much larger. So uh, this was done with Dee Gardner, a colleague of mine at BYU. And so we created this academic vocabulary list, which was released three or four years ago. On the one hand, we wanted to not include high-frequency words, but on the other hand, just for general English, but on the other hand, we didn't want to have words like this that are limited to a particular domain in academic English. So there were lots and lots of different tests that we used, a little bit science, a little bit art, to going back and forth on this until we came up with a list that we thought represented high frequency words that you would find in academic across all of the domains of academic. So this gives you an idea of the types of words that are in that list. And there, this is freely available from academicwords.info. Uh, one of the nice things on that as well is that you can um, also uh, find out the words for a particular uh, uh, domain like law and political science or science and medicine. And one of the nice things about this as well is that compared to the academic word list from Coxhead, there's just a lot more information here on the frequency of the particular lemmas and grouping things by lemmas and so on. Just very briefly, uh, so you have a word list like this, but one of the problems that teachers have is they say, well, what do I do with this word list? How can I find out how these words are really used? And so Dee Gardner and I uh, worked on integrating this into word and phrase, which allows students to come in and click on any word in the academic vocabulary list, find the frequency across the different uh, domains of academic, so uh, law, philosophy, science, and so on, see keyword in context, see synonyms for that word, see collocates for that word, definitions, and this is all clickable, so you can go from one word to another to another. You can even input entire text, and you could say, for example, I want to compare this to medical English. It will highlight the words that it recognizes as being medical. It'll generate keyword lists and so on. So the last thing I want to talk about just very briefly is, I mean, that's nice because that's getting us towards academic vocabulary. But as Uda was mentioning, one thing that we really have to deal with is very, very specific kinds of language. And so um, uh, last year, I created the Wikipedia corpus. This is based on uh, about 2 billion words of text, about 4.4 million web pages. And as you know, Wikipedia covers everything under the sun. And so when I, what I did when I created this is I wanted users to be able to come in and create virtual corpora on any topic at all that they're interested in. So via the interface, they could say, find me words that in the title uh, have something referring to biology, okay? And then using a lot of different heuristics, it kind of guesses what Wikipedia articles would be more, most useful. So after just a couple of seconds, it comes back with a list like this. Or for example, I could say, find me articles that have the word investment within the article itself, and it's gonna generate a virtual corpus like this. You can do all kinds of things with these virtual corpora. You can move articles from one to another. You can delete, you can add, and so on. Uh, but then what's nice is once you've created one of these virtual corpora, and it just takes, like I say, uh, a minute or so to do it, you can then search within that virtual corpus. So here I've selected my investment virtual corpus. I'm looking for market noun just within that virtual corpus. Or for example, collocates of market just within my investment corpus. Or in this case, I'm looking at uh, stress in context, keywording context in an engineering corpus that I've created, stress corrosion, uh, and so on, or I can search within a psychology corpus that I've created. Um, and one of the nice things you can do as well is once you've created a virtual corpus, then you can simply say, 
show me what the keywords for that particular virtual corpus are. So for biology, in just a second or two, it will generate keyword lists like this. You can see all these words in context. You want a more specific list, you can choose that. For my investments corpus, it's going to generate a list like this, investment fund, company, bank, capital, investor, or a more specific list. And the last thing that I'd mention is that the ability to create these uh, um, virtual corpora, you can now do it within any of the BYU corpora, not just Wikipedia, but even within, for example, COCA, creating a virtual corpus dealing with, let's say, astronomy. Um, so anyway, uh, that hopefully gives you an idea of uh, some of the resources that are available. COCA, the 105 million words of academic, uh, the frequency data, word and phrase, as well as these nice virtual corpora that allow you to zero in on the Lexus of a particular domain. Thanks. Thank you, Mark. And I have to say, every time I see Mark, there's some new thing being developed at BYU. And I think, do you sleep, is my general thought on that. Um, but very grateful for everything that's happening there. Uh, as we continue to think about how to use corpora in language learning and language teaching. And as you heard earlier, it's really important as we celebrate the ELI, I mean, the context of the University of Michigan is important to what ELI has been able to do. And part of that is that it's sitting next to the libraries at Michigan. And the, the University of Michigan libraries have been pioneers in uh, creating databases of text. Uh, this is the Google Book Project. It's also Ebo and other things that Sigurd Cartel is here to talk with us about as we have been doing these massive projects to bring literature, literary texts, um, and other texts online. So I'm delighted to welcome Sigrid Anderson Cordell, who is the Librarian for English Language and Literature here at Michigan. She has a PhD in English Literature from the University of Virginia. Her research focuses on race, gender, and transatlantic print culture in the 19th century. And she wrote the book, Fictions of Descent, Reclaiming Authority in Transatlantic Women's Writing of the Late 19th Century. Um, and she's here today to talk with us about the databases that, at the libraries and how we can think about corpora and what's happening at the libraries as we think about different kinds of databases. So Sigrid, thank you for being here. Thank you, Anne. I don't know if that'll get low enough for me. Well, thank you. Um, as you can hear from my bio, I come at all of this from a slightly different angle. I come at this from the angle of literary studies as well as as a librarian, where my job is often to help people put together corpora that they can use for their research. So I want to think a little bit today about cobbling and the cobbling of corpora and the kinds of pressures that we're seeing on our databases and on our electronic collections and what's possible and sort of where we are at this moment. Um, for the, um, what we're seeing at this moment is that a lot of work that people want to do with our electronic resources are not always things that um, our databases always support. So we sometimes have to be creative about that. And, um, you know, for the most part, our electronic collections that we subscribe to or purchase um, here at the library or if you're at a different institution at other libraries, they are almost always constrained by some kinds of licensing agreements that will stop um, or at least um, constrain against being able to scrape text wholesale from a lot of our electronic collections to let you do the kind of analysis that you might want to do. But I want to talk a little bit about where we are at that moment. Um, and here, here's, in some ways, the situation in a nutshell. 
is that for the last however many years, publishers have put tons of resources into building these databases and electronic collections um, that are really about what was at one point the gold standard of keyword searching across databases that were really meant to extract results that were meant to be read by the human eye. And in the last 10 years or so, there's a lot of pressure on these kinds of collections to, be, to allow machine reading at scale of different sorts. And what we're seeing is we're watching publishers create that business model. We're watching them try to figure out how they'll protect their resources while allowing researchers to do the kind of analytical um, machine reading work that they want to do. Um, so I'm gonna talk today about <clears throat> effectively what I think of two models of response that we're seeing at the moment. The first one I'm gonna call the tightly controlled, and the second one I'm gonna call the fire hose. You might be able to guess what I'm gonna say about those. Um, so to begin with the tightly controlled, um, Gale is a publisher, a vendor that we purchase a lot of materials from, both in terms of reference materials, scholarly materials, news materials, but primary source materials as well, manuscript materials, newspapers, things like that. And they have recently moved all of their primary source materials onto one database, um, one platform that's called Artemis, but actually don't become too attached to that because the Gale rep told me yesterday they're ditching Artemis in the title. Um, but on their platform, you can search across all 24 of the databases that here at Michigan we subscribe to or have purchased. Um, so we've got newspapers, we've got manuscripts, we've got a bit of chronological range, we've got geographic range, we've got different kinds of genres here. So there's lots of ways that you can imagine wanting to extract different slices of this to work with in different kinds of ways. What the database interface allows you to do um, is the sort of traditional work. You can do keyword searching, pull your results, narrow it in different kinds of ways. If you want to um, create a sort of mini corpus or a larger corpus, it does, they have created the functionality that you can download document by document the plain text of any particular document. So they've worked it right in so that you can get either a PDF or an OCR text. But they haven't at this moment enabled any kind of bulk download. So you have to do this document by document. Um, every time I talk to the Gale people, I'm like, wouldn't it be nice if you could have these results and like automatically, you know, sort of create a corpus like that? And they're like, um, we haven't yet gotten there in that conversation. But that's sort of where we are with this sort of cumbersome, piecemeal kind of corpus creation that you could do. Um, they've also put some money into, or some resources, into developing tools because people are asking to be doing different kinds of analysis with these ma uh, materials. Um, so they've created these visualization tools that live on the database. So this um, term cluster tool that is essentially a proximity search. So you take your results and you can visualize it. So here I did a, just a search, you can't see it, but for celebrity between 1800 and 1899, then I asked to visualize the results. It tells me which words showed up most frequently in relation to that. So novel was the biggest one. I just drilled down on memoirs there and it will allow you to get into those documents and you can see those keywords you know, by going in in context. It doesn't allow you to extract it or create a concordance or do anything like that. You have to do the sort of piecemeal work to make it happen. They have also, but you also can look at it as a wheel if you like that better. Um, and they've created a term frequency over time that you can do. So here, the blue is celebrity, the black is famous. You can see it diverged in the mid 1970s. I have no idea why it plummets in um, the mid 2000s, except I'm sort of guessing, I mean, you don't, in some ways you don't have as much control over this corpus because you're just, you know, it's just everything that's in there. I'm guessing maybe they have fewer documents in that period, that might account for it in some way, but you don't really know because you don't actually get under the hood in the way that you want to in building this. Um, so that's what I think of as being a sort of tightly controlled. They're giving us a little bit of functionality, but not a whole lot that we can really extract things and do what we want to do. On the, on the other side of that, um, what I was thinking, what I'm thinking of as the fire hose model is um, publishers who are saying, okay, you want to do analysis on our materials, well, here you go. Um, ProQuest, for example, 
from whom we buy a lot of historical newspapers. And there's a lot of interest in doing different kinds of data mining um, and text mining research on newspapers from people in all sorts of disciplines. Um, so ProQuest has said, okay, well, if you as a library have purchased perpetual access to one of our newspaper collections, then you can pay a little bit extra and we will give you that newspaper as a data set that you can work with. So we have here piloted 11 newspapers. Um, these four we have already downloaded, we already have them, um, to get us a little bit of chronological range, a little bit of geographic range. Um, we have seven more in the queue that are coming. Um, I did promise my colleagues that I would mention that these, these um, data sets are fully available to anyone at the, who's a U of M affiliate, but if you want to work with this collection, you need to actually meet with one of our librarians and talk about um, data security and sign a memorandum of, of understanding. That is ProQuest, essentially their business model. You can have it, but you can't share it outside of, outside of um, who's purchased it. If you're interested, email me. I can, I can help you with that. But just to talk a little bit, so, so they will give you these whole data sets. And let me tell you a little bit about what you get when you do it, um, which is that, so here's, here's what the underlying data is. Essentially, it works from the original newspaper collection. So this comes from the LA Times. I, this is something that I just pulled up. So you can see the quality is not particularly good. These are newspapers that were in, microfilmed and then, data, um, the, then digitized and then OCR, you can see all kinds of noise there that can come in. So as you can imagine, this is the same article as it shows up um, in the data set. It's got all sorts of characters that you'd have to extract, word breaks, so I can talk about why later, um, um, nonsense words. So you'd have to do a lot of cleaning up. I'm working with the LA Times data set at the moment, so between 1881 and 1931, that's 4.5 million files. I'm not gonna go in and clean those up individually, right? So you have to figure out at scale how to do that. And the other point I would say about this fire hose then is that we have this OCR, sort of it's a dirty data set in lots of ways, but it also requires quite a bit of programming expertise to be able to work with it, to work at scale. I've got a graduate student who knows Python who is extracting it even to tell me um, the chronology of the files, because they're just not in any particular order. There's no file names that tell you anything. It's just, here you go, um, work with that. But um, in some ways, this is um, just a lot better than what we get in, in, in the other example. Just to point very quickly um, to another, another collection that's similar, where we don't have the same, we have the same kind of fire hose, but we don't have the same maybe OCR problems, which is the EBO TCP project. So that's the Early English Books Text Creation Partnership Project that's built on the Early English Books. Um, so it's essentially text between 1471 and 1700 that were originally microfilmed and then scanned. You can't do OCR on early modern fonts. It just, we're just not there yet. So they rekeyed these texts. We have, it's 60,000 texts, uh, 60,000 files at the moment that are um, freely available. But we have, again, the same sort of, we have much cleaner text, but we have the same kind of technological barriers. On the left-hand side is how you get the files. They're under TCP numbers. Someone has written an R package to let you extract, I want everything from this year, or everything by this author. But a lot of humanists, or a lot of researchers are not necessarily um, ready to do that. These are what the files look like with the XML coding, so you have to decide what to strip out, what to keep. You can't just throw that into AntConc like that because it's gonna be very interesting results that you might get. Um, there's so much interest in this, set, in this set though that there are a lot of people who are working on creating tools to work with it that are easier. Early Modern Print at Washington University St. Louis has created an Ebo Ngram browser as well as a Keywords in Context because um, to do that kind of work. Um, so let me just conclude really quickly by saying that um, we are not at the moment where we can do um, the kind of research or analytical work on the text in our collections that we would like to as easily as we would like to do that. But 
publishers are becoming more flexible in making things available. And um, you can often do more than you can do right on the, on the interface. But what I would say is, um, if you're here or whatever institution you may be at, work with your library on this. Because not only um, because we can tell you, well, maybe there's this other set or maybe we can get materials, but we work actively to advocate for researchers with the publishers. They always want to hear what people want to be able to do to build that kind of functionality in. And so, um, so work with us, ask questions. Um, there are lots of things available. Um, just sometimes it takes a little bit of wrangling to make it work. Thank you. Thank you, Sigrid, for sharing what's happening with these. And I think, and I like your point at the end of, I mean, as the, these corpora have developed, part of this has been demands from users that have shaped what becomes possible when we say, this is what I need to be able to do, and the builders say, okay, let's see if we can help you do what you're, what you're trying to do. So we now have our last speaker. For those of you who, we started a little bit late, and Angelo kindly said that we can run a little bit late so that we'll have time for a conversation at the end of this. Um, I'm delighted to welcome our last speaker, Nick Ellis, who is a professor of psychology, a professor of linguistics, and a research scientist at the English Language Institute. His research interests include language acquisition, cognition, corpus linguistics, cognitive linguistics, applied linguistics, and psycholinguistics. Um, he's co-authored a recent book on these themes with Uta Romer, um, and their co-author is called Usage-Based Approaches to Language Acquisition and Processing, Cognitive and Corpus Investigations of Construction Grammar. And so Nick is gonna circle us back, I think, to some databases that you were hearing, corporate you were hearing about at the beginning of the panel, and talk about some of the research that he's been doing. So Nick, thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here to see old friends uh, to celebrate 75 years of the ELI. Um, I'm going to be talking about the ELI at 75, corpus linguistics, and language learning. Um, and for me, a good corpus is a large collection of relevant data that is out there and open access against which we can test our hypotheses. We can argue about it. It's common ground and we can test our hypotheses. One hypothesis, one suggestion last night was that the ELI was founded in 1941. And so wanting to test that, I looked in Google Books, and this is the Google Books, what is it, like 10 to 15% of the books ever printed. And this is the English Language Institute. People are starting to talk about it very shortly after 1941. I also wondered about the importance of anniversaries, and so using Marx Corpora, I looked at anniversaries, there's lots of anniversaries. Uh, 50th, 50th and 25th anniversary, well, they're 10 a penny, really, but 75, 75th anniversary is rather more important. And what do we do with anniversaries? Well, we celebrate them, we commemorate them, we don't forget them, uh, but like last night, we toast them. And so corpora can be useful in testing hypotheses to see how people are talking about things, to see how language works. Um, when I first came to the University of Michigan, I was so privileged to join the English Language Institute. And there, as Uta said, we had um, the beginnings of corpora being used if students, if instructors, if theorists want to research and teach English for academic purposes then I guess what was in John's mind was that then we ought to know what English for academic purposes is. And so we ought to gather English for academic purposes across the university. And that's what my case is. And it's very much the first, and it's very much still a much used and very useful tool. In the time since then, thanks to John's um, initiatives, 
and Uta and colleagues um, um, and Rita's um, good sense and good efforts. We now have my cusp as well as a corpus collection of undergraduate student papers. I was a psycholinguist. I'm interested in um, language in the mind. I'm interested in language usage. I'm also interested in language instruction. And these have had a huge influence on my work, as they have on, on the world more generally, I think, because research across the ELI coordinated, had corporate its core, but those were corpora to inform research, to inform teaching, and to inform testing. And again, that was way before um, everybody else was picking up. The big testing organizations now have corporate at their core, but it was the ELI that was doing that really before anybody else. So um, one of my interests in joining the team was in academic language, and Uta's already talked about the project which Rita Simpson-Blach and I did on trying to come up with a list of useful academic phrase phraseology. And this is the sort of thing that you can do with a good corpus, as Mark's been telling us. So what we were interested in, oh, interesting, interesting, um, interesting things. What we were interested in doing is, is, is identifying um, first of all, Z, and then Y, and then X. We were interested in identifying the phraseology that was important in academic speech and academic writing. So we had to find that phraseology and compare it to normal speech and normal writing. So we had four collections of language, spoken academic language, written academic language, spoken non-academic language, and spoken non-academic uh, and written non-academic language. And what we're interested in doing is, is identifying the phraseology that is special to, to the university. And we did that. But remember the uh, context in which we're working. Um, we want to use corpus techniques and use the objectivity of corpus techniques, but then relate them to instruction and relate them to the insights of the instructors and the testers who... Um, who have been sp specializing in these, in these aspects for the last 75 years. And for me, I want to know about psycholinguistic reality. I want, to, I want to relate what the corpus has to say about language representation. So one of the things that we did, having done all our, our corpus searches and identified that phraseology, was that then we went back to the instructors, we went back to the testers, and asked them, so we've identified some phrases, but do you think they're worth talking about? Do you think the formulae which we've identified are, are indeed formulae? They have a cohesive meaning or function, because if they have a cohesive meaning, they might be very relevant uh, to, to expression. And as an instructor, do you think that these things are worth talking about? And data, data, data. One of the things that we found interesting was that corpus metrics, like frequency, like mutual information, like range of coverage, um, well, they correlated, they correlated with instructor evaluations of whether or not these things are worth teaching. So now we're getting some triangulation. We're getting, we can do some searches, but we're also tapping into the insights of the instructors in terms of these are things that are worth instructing, uh, worth talking about. Um, so we did that. We also did experiments on reading and naming and understanding of these corpora in second language learners. And so we have two or three papers where we're trying to do that triangulation. We're identifying things in corpora, but then we're checking, checking the validity of these against instructor insights and against facilitated processing, both in native speakers and in second language learners. I want to also talk about language learning. Another um, important uh, development from the ELI was a few years after 1941, but not long which was the foundation of the journal Language Learning from Charles Fries and Kenneth Pike. Language Learning, um, the journal Language Learning, this is the very first issue in 1948. Um, language Learning also has um, increased in relevance and importance. Um, the journal still goes strongly today, still goes strongly today here, um, copyright the Language Learning Research Club at the University of Michigan. Many people in this room are associated 
with language learning one way or another. We always meet every year at the University of Michigan, but we're not a local affair. Again, here is a, a corpus, Google Scholar corpus, which according to the Google Scholar H5 metrics, puts language learning as the second most citable, most influential uh, journal across language and linguistics. This is a very broad uh, collection um, of journals, and yet language learning is doing something interesting in modern linguistics and modern language sciences. And I, I think what it's doing interesting is it's reflecting the fact that perspectives on language have changed markedly in the last 10 or 20 years. And sort of a buzzword nowadays is, is usage-based linguistics. Actually, this is a, um, a return to a perspective on language um, that was, that was uh, important here, again, in the world of, of, of Charles Fries, um, that what we're interested in is language usage and how we use language to communicate. Nowadays, we talk about usage-based linguistics, cognitive linguistics, the fact that we've, we, we learn patterns of language that convey particular meanings in particular communities. Um, and corpus linguistics is very much at the core of all of that. Um, one of the projects that most recently we've been doing, Uta and myself, is looking at verb argument constructions, particular patterns of language, across 100 million words of um, English usage. We can do it because there are corpora that are uh, accessible and searchable. We can look at the verbs which appear in these patterns. We can find that language usage is highly patterned. And you only know it's highly patterned if you go in there and look. But the interesting thing about the highly patterned aspects of language is that they're highly patterned in ways that promote acquisition, promote us sharing the same language. And that's interesting. And we can investigate those patterns in language, those patterns in language, and we can measure those sorts of things. And then we can go and do experiments, and we can look at the processing of language and when we look at the processing of language, what we find is that the processing of language is affected by those things we measure in the corpora, is affected by frequency, is affected by the reliability with which a verb will work in a particular construction, and is affected by meaning, so the prototypicality of meaning. So again, we're getting the coming together of um, corpus evidence, um, instructor and researcher evidence, and psycholinguistic processing. Finally, we were asked about what's happening, where, what, what's the future? And for me, the future lies in, again, this usage-based linguistics. The next special issue of language learning, which is to appear at the beginning of next year, is based on a conference that we held within the Corpus Linguistics Conference based at the ESRC Center in Lancaster last year, where we had experts from across the field, talking about what's the future of corpus linguistics. Um, so language learning research at the intersection of experimental corpus-based and computational methods. And here we have a range of scholars. Uh, those of you in the, in the trade will recognize that these are some of the key, some, some of the key child language researchers, second language researchers, natural language processing researchers, um, Tony McHenry and this team are the head of the ESRC Center in, in Lancaster. And what are they talking about for the future? They're saying corpora are big. Corpora are at the center of the language sciences. We're going to combine corpora with computational analyses and experimental data. Um, we are going to learn so much about language itself from applying computational linguistics to these databases. We can use these to understand second language acquisition, so we need learner corpora as well. We can mark up these corpora so they're much more useful um, to search for what has the learner got, what has the learner not got. Um, we can look at pragmatics. We can look at learner corpora to inform second uh, language <laughs> testing. Um, there are now large corpora of learners um, working 
everyday learning language, and we can analyze these patterns to look at second language acquisition. We can enhance input online to facilitate acquisition. And I'm going to finish with Brian McWinney there. Those of you who know child language acquisition know the name Brian McWinney at um, Carnegie Mellon University. There are the Childers and Talk Bank projects, which revolutionized the study of child language acquisition. Child language acquisition was people having insights about child language acquisition before child language acquisition was based on corpora. And so it changed the field. Suddenly, researchers have transcripts of child language and parental language where they can say, look, this is what's happening. Look, this is what's happening at 18 months old, at 20 months old, at 26 months old. This is how language is, is spoken to children. This is what children get out of it. It changed the field. Um, corpora are changing the field of second language acquisition and applied linguistics, too. So finally, in summary, language usage is highly patterned. We only know about the patterns by looking at it. Language acquisition is guided by this pattern. Language users know all of the language that they've been exposed to in their lives implicitly, and that tunes their language processing. I think we're in a world now of, of, of usage-based learning and usage-based instruction. And it's the coming together of these different fields, corpus linguistics, cognitive linguistics, the computational work, natural language processing, with theories of acquisition and theories of instruction. Thank you. Um, thank you, all four of you, for such a terrific panel and not a fire hose, but a huge amount of information we just got with, I hope, I, I heard people going, oh wait, I don't know about that database. <laughs> I'm going to go look at that. I'm going to try that out in my classroom. So um, Angela has said we can move on to Michigan time, which means we'll take this panel until 11 and then the next one will start at 1110. Uh, so we have 15 minutes and I would love to open the floor for questions and for the four panelists so that we can get some conversation um, among the panelists as well. So questions and comments from the floor. If you have a question, we would appreciate getting it on the mic for the recording. Yes. Katie and I have mics. So we've got so one. Raise a hand and over here. Here. Both of you. All right. And Hi. This is from Mark Davies. Um, I was intrigued by the comparison uh, between the non-academic and the academic samples. I was curious, where do the non Academic samples come from. You mentioned fiction. I'm wondering if there were other sources. Are these supposed to be? Yeah, I, <coughs> I do technology, but I don't know how to run microphones. So, um, so COCA is divided overall and also year by year uh, into five sections that are have equal representation. Um, spoken, which is based on transcripts of shows like Oprah or Good Morning America. Fiction, popular magazines, newspapers, and then academic. And of course in this context I wouldn't be talking much about this, but one of the nice things is having the same genre representation year by year. It allows, you're comparing apples to apples when you compare the early 90s and the, let's say, 2005 to the current time to look at recent change, which is something that I'm really interested in. So, and Angela, we had a question. Thank you. Okay, so um, this is a quick question for Nick Ellis. Um, when you were referring to the teacher um, instinctual evaluation of what's useful, were there, uh, looking at teachers, was there any regional variation or variation across what kind of teaching they were doing or levels they were doing or any, any things like that? It seems like at least regional variation might have been, might have played a role in some way. Uh, uh, 
this is already on. Thank you. It's a, it's a great question. Um, we didn't have a large enough sample to do that. And so uh, the respondents in the analysis um, of the academic formulas list were our, our colleagues. So it was the instructors of the testing division within the ALI. But it's a great question. Um, at the moment, the focus is much more on trying to get representative language. But for sure, the collaboration needs to be done across instructors, across um, theories of instruction. So looking at um, different populations of, um, of specialists as well as uh, different populations of language. So I know we had a question back here. I actually, whoa, sorry. <laughs> I actually just wanted to make a comment and thank you for the mic husk because my students love it. They find it to be particularly helpful with prepositions and with framing verbs because often they're struggling to find verbs other than the author said. Um, and so they find the mic husk to be really, really helpful for that. And I actually enjoy it too. So thank you for that. And I would encourage everyone who doesn't already use Corpora with their students to spread the word about how helpful they are. She was not a plant. <laughs> <laughs> right, and I think many of us have found this is true for second language learning, foreign language learning, and for students who are just trying to learn register variation. That this is, as Mark showed us, the, you know, do you use a lot of reasons in academic writing? And many of us in this room have an intuition of no. <laughs> but for a student to actually search that and go, oh, <laughs> look at that, or search however or therefore and see how it distributes can be a really, it's, it's, you know, as we all know, this is active learning where they go in and, and see it for themselves. I actually have some, if we have a minute, I have yeah. some usage stats. Um, I have a couple of slides that I could show um, to see, just to, to visualize the impact of um, my custom and my case and the resources that we created here. Um, if you go back to my slide. Check this out. This is going to be our high tech part of <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Perfect. Well, that's the encore slides um, section. <laughs> so I just wanted to share this with you because I started tracking traffic on the ELI Corpora websites uh, when, I, when I was here at Michigan. And this is just uh, traffic for four years, 2010, 2014. Uh, you see that, that there were 173,000 sessions. This does not include the MyCase online search interface, which separately had about a half a million hits half a million sessions every year. Um, these are just the resources like MyCusp and teaching materials and um, John Swales' kibitzers that researchers accessed. And you can see that these researchers come from 196 countries. Uh, these are the top um, 10 countries, US, United Kingdom, Taiwan, Germany, China, and so on. But it goes all the way down um, to Sierra Leone and um, Monaco and the Gambia. Um, Burkina Faso. So um, I, I think that just shows what, what, the, uh, what an impact uh, our resources have had and, and how many people around the world um, use them. Hi, I was wondering if there is a social media corpus or if uh, social media language is included in any of the corpora that we've talked about. Uh. <laughs> Yeah, I recently wrote an introduction to a, a handbook on corpus linguistics where I was looking in a crystal ball trying to predict what would happen in the next 20, 30 years. And my sense was that that's the future of corpus linguistics is uh, tapping into social media. I think in 30 years we'll look back with fondness on one in two billion word corpora and wonder how did we do so much with so very little. Um, but the problem we have with social media is, for example, with Twitter, you can uh, download Twitter feeds. Uh, that's totally acceptable. You cannot reshare them with anyone. So that really limits, the, I mean, I've, I've tried, right? Because I like data. Uh, but I don't want to go to jail, so you can't do that. <laughs> Facebook, uh, totally impossible right now. But for me, that is, I, I just created a corpus called Now, um, News on the Web, where it gets about 10,000 articles from newspapers, but also magazines, tech, entertainment, stuff like that. 
about 10,000 articles a day and adds those to the corpus. It's about 3.7 billion words now, growing by about 130 million words a month. And it's not the level of informality that I'd like, but at least it does allow us to look at language as an ongoing uh, thing, which, again, for me is really cool. Um, so at, at the library, we have, our data librarians have subscribed to a service that people can get for a limited amount of time to pull the fire hose of Twitter. Um, and it's, um, I don't know the details about that, but we do have that. There is also a certain amount of archiving of social media material, both in the Internet Archives collection, as well as individual collections. So the Bentley Library on campus has collected things like the hashtag BBUM, being, being black at UM. And they can't, because they can't make it publicly available, though I, I think that what they're doing at the moment is they're depositing it at um, in deep blue behind it's password protected so that we're trying to make access to that because that's really there's a lot of potential research that can be done with social media but there are all sorts of problems with terms of, ser terms of service limitations privacy limitations anything that's password protected anything like that is really really hard to do but there's um, we're trying to figure it out so that we can make those materials available in whatever ways we can there was a wonderful article uh, last year in PLOS One where they analyzed the Facebook posts, something like 200,000 Facebook posts, and categorized them by gender and by age. And I show this to my students. And so what you have are uh, 16 to 18 year olds, language men and female, undergraduates, language men and female, and old language, male and female, and you know, we talk about different things. <laughs> um, send me an email and I'll, I'll send you the reference. Got time for another question or two? Do we have a, microphone's here. Yeah, I'm intrigued by the idea that there are patterns in data, okay, and there are language learners who look at those patterns, so if Nick would expound on how the looking at patterns actually pushes language acquisition, and how do you know? Oh, lots of good questions. Um, <laughs> um, all of the work is correlation. But what we can do is we can look at the language which, for example, a child or a second language, language learner is exposed to. And when we look at the patterns of that language, then what we can see is that, for example, in particular types of construction, like a, like a verb object locative. So what we want to do in language is talk about <coughs> someone or something moving things to a new place or to to a new direction. That's an, an interesting meaning that everybody wants to talk about. But if we look at verb, object, locative, verb, argument constructions, what we see is that the types of verb that appear in those are really very interesting. So the evidence which a child gets or a second language learner gets is swamped by one lead verb. And the one lead verb is put, because you can put anything anywhere. You can put an ocean liner somewhere, and you can put a pin somewhere. And so, if you look at the patterns of verbs which appear in particular constructions, then what you find is that they're not a normal distribution or a flat distribution. They're a zip field distribution, the type of distribution which is interestingly characteristic of language, but also characteristic of complex adaptive systems, robust systems. And so, if we analyze the patterns of language, and I want to talk just about looking at language, I'm talking about transcribed language of parents talking to children, what we see are that parents use particular registers and particular high-frequency verbs, and there are certain verbs which appear in those patterns much more frequently. And lo and behold, those high-frequency verbs are also characteristic of the meaning of those constructions. Port is the prototypical verb object locative verb, just as go is the prototypical verb locative 
or give is the prototypical or diatransitive. So what we can do is we can look at the evidence which language learners are exposed to, and the first learned verbs um, that children or second language learners acquire, and at least in terms of lexical and phrasal patterning, not morphology, but lexical and phrasal patterning, there are very interesting correlations between the evidence which children are exposed to and uh, the language they require. Please do. Well, I've looked at a lot of interlanguage data sets qualitatively, and what I do know is that non-native speakers put idiosyncratic meanings on target language words, or target language-like words. For example, they might say, well, a lot of studies we've done, they might say, I pick the children from the kindergarten, and you don't know if it's pick up or whatever. So what I don't understand is how the idiosyncratic meanings of what interlanguage speakers, in my phraseology, put on target language words are understood by any of these corpora. That's what I don't understand. Does that make sense to you? Um, I, I understand what you said. I think I understand. Because um, when you I, say meaning, it's target language meaning. And that's not what happens with non-native speakers. Sure. Um, when I'm looking at the meaning level in these constructions, I'm looking at the meanings of the verbs, the lexical verbs, and the phrasal patterns. And I am making reference to those in terms of the target language meaning. And so your example there, I picked um, the kids from, I, I picked the kids from school or something like that. Yeah, I picked the kids from the kindergarten. Right, okay. Put so in a number of things. It, it could you mean get interlanguage synonyms that are not target language synonyms. Sure. Is that, is that, are you following that? I, I'm, I'm, absolutely. And we, indeed, we have a long way to go to start analyzing these things in terms of interlanguage semantics. That is, there is no interlanguage semantics, is my. Well, I, 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 I'm not sure. Um, I, I, I suspect that you believe that in interlanguage, the learners have meanings, are trying to express meanings, and they're trying, trying their damnedest to express meanings which they believe are there in the target language community and expressed in those ways. And I think that um, I picked the children from school um, is interesting in that I think they have chosen the right lexical verb. What they haven't got are the relevant bits of morphology and grammar around that. And the, the, a central question is the highest frequency forms of the language, the functors, end up being the most difficult elements. And so what is it that's different between morphology and grammatical function words and these lexical words which seem to be, the second language learner can learn lexis quite well. There is no fossilization in terms of the acquisition of lexis. What happens is the difficulty is there in the grammar. And the really interesting and hot issue, an important issue, is why do second language learners have difficulty with morphosyntax? Why do they leave out the ups and the b's and the a's and the past tense markers? Right. Um, what is it that's special about those things? And I have a, I have a story. It's a long story. I'd love to talk about it. Yeah, it's a long conversation. Right. Yes. And I'm going to give Uta just, sorry, I did Uta the last word on this because then I have to wrap up the, the panel. Um, I think one thing we need to look at to answer your question is um, learner corpora that, that capture language of learners across uh, proficiency development. So uh, longitudinal corpora, cross sectional corpora. And um, Nick and I have just started mining. Um, a, a database that captures those um, learners at different levels for those rep argument constructions. And one thing we see there is something interesting that um, uh, you see at very low levels of proficiency, A1, A2 in the CFR framework, learners already have a good sense of the constructions, the verb constructions that we find are most frequent in usage, and they use them correctly with the, the the, the core lead verbs, and then at B1, B2 level, they become more creative, and they use um, synonyms of those verbs that are not used by native speakers. So that's maybe when, when they would say things like, I pick the children. Um, and then as they become more advanced, they figure out from usage, from input, 
oh, this is not discussed about, is not, is not a good usage, uh, report, report about maybe, but um, so, so at that point, and we can see that through correlation data, um, and another thing that, that tells us, yeah, we know that that's how learners use, um, or that's how learners acquire uh, these constructions, is that we triangulate usage data captured in corpora with psycholinguistic evidence. Um, that, that allows us to see, well, that's what, those are the verbs that they most strongly associate yeah. with those constructions. So there's a lot of evidence that um, points in the directions of usage-based language acquisition. So I want to thank, I know we could keep discussing this and we'll have the coffee hour and lunch and the afternoon to continue the discussion. I want to thank again our panel for the beefy, brawny <laughs> discussion that we have had here. So if we can give them one more round of applause and then... Thank you so much, Anne, and thank you, panelists, yes, for that amazing uh, discussion. I, you heard it here, folks. Corpora are big. Corpora, corpora are at the center of language sciences. And, and uh, like those, those ELI students arriving in 1953, knowing nothing about corpora, an hour and a half later, <laughs> we've, we've mastered it. But um, so thank you. That was, that was really, really wonderful, and thanks for getting us off to such a, a great start. So. We do, we are a little behind time. We've been very ambitious with our program today, with our scheduling, and we knew that. So thank you for your patience. We're, we, 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 we will try as best as we can to give all these discussions the proper, proper time. As, as Anne said, we really could go on and on. But we are gonna take a brief break now. We have about 10 minutes. Um, important information, their restrooms are gendered on this floor. There's men to the east and women to the west. Uh, gender neutral facilities are downstairs, third floor. Also handicap accessible uh, facilities on the third floor and the first floor in the lobby. Uh, across the hall, there should be some coffee, tea, drinks, and um, we'll get back at it, about 10 minutes. Thank you.